Good evening and welcome to another installment of Bite by Bite, a journey into the gift of living in the divine will. I'm Larry Leopold. I'm a Carmelite and as we enter into these last weeks of Lent, on a bit, perhaps a little more somber note, we are now moving into the, the second hour of the agony of Jesus on the cross. And so as we uh, take a moment to go there, Let's just take a moment and pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, dear Lord, you whose love for us know no bounds, uh, we call on you to help us journey with you, united with you in your passion, by locating into your very heart to see what we find there, and then take it as our own. And what we find is unconstrained love. And so tonight, as we now look at this love that Jesus has for each one of us, uh, we move over to uh, the first of three words, right? Three words, the last words of Jesus on the cross. Right? And as we do that, I'd like to just bring up this as an image for us to uh, be able to kind of focus on Jesus tonight. And so we see these three words. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Woman, this is your son, and I thirst. All right, so the second word of Jesus on the cross, I'd like to just take a portion of our uh, Hours of the Passion, where we talk about that, and then, and then go into some of what the, the Book of Heaven teaches us about that as well. So we read there that Jesus, your constrained love is stronger than death itself. And wanting to pour it out, looking at the thief on your right, you steal him from hell. And with your grace, you touch his heart. And that thief is completely changed. He recognizes you. He professes you God and perfectly contrite says, Lord, remember me when you are in your kingdom. And you, you do not hesitate to answer. Today, you will be with me in paradise, making of him the first triumph of your love. And so we see several things just in this first portion of that hour where Jesus's love becomes the defining factor in each of these three words. And not just his love, his constrained love. God, who is love, only desires to pour it out and see the increase of love. But man, through the sin of Adam, has... Uh, brought on this damaged human will, which now rejects God. It neglects him, turns our back on this love. And so God, in the, in, in the humanity of Jesus now, suffers the constraint of not having this love to pour out on anyone. And so we see here that this love is stronger than death. And so in Jesus, the first words, uh, on this second hour, that he's looking now to where he can give his love. And he turns his eyes to the right and sees there the good thief, right? And he says to him, touching his heart with his gaze, and his very eyes produce a conversion, a metanoia in that thief, who a moment before we see in another gospel was mocking Jesus telling him to cut down off his cross, right? But now, as we see now, he professes God, recognizes him. How did he recognize Jesus as God? Uh, we know that Mary Magdalene did. We know that uh, the, the woman at the Samaritan well did. We know that Jesus did. But each of these were, were miracles of grace. And so it is here as well. This prodigy of grace is the outpouring of God's frustrated love 
even then and the cross as the clock is ticking and the sands of time are running out on his life this desperation to pour out this love to save another soul from hell he chooses the thief, the thief on his right who then responds with with the fullness of belief and contrition thereby not only getting absolution from his sins but according to church tradition immediately gaining access to paradise to heaven with jesus as promised so as we understand how this love of jesus even on the cross is continually looking to save souls from hell as we saw last week in his desire uh, to to free all of us from our sin the sin of of crucifying our god and he said father forgive them for they know not what they do and in this a moment where he now looks to the thief on the on the point of his about to die and uses all his power to save him from hell we see this great mercy of god which we read about in other parts of the book of heaven that jesus does what he calls the final gift of love at the point of death he calls it his catch of the day ironically having hung out with fishermen so much <laughs> that he takes this moment of death when we are about to pass from life into eternity from time into timelessness he says almost with this last breath while we still have our free will and there he reveals to those who are dying himself in all his sweetness his immensity of love and all the joy and bliss of heaven for that soul who may have not until that point seen god or accepted god maybe he's rejected god maybe he's in sin and jesus offers us this last moment this last mercy so that we can consent to our death receive him and thereby avoid hell and gain the heaven that that the journey of purgatory allows us this beautiful and merciful gift is offered he says and gives us the hope especially for those who we love um, children uh, parents loved ones friends those who we don't know what the state of their soul is and we dare not presume but we can hope that jesus in this final moment allows them the grace to say yes and i would say that in this gift of the divine will right that in this trans temporal gift to be able to go back in time in the eternal now so that we might be able to at that moment of their death be able to come with the divine grace that we know we can cre create by having jesus our our savior living in his person within us doing our divine acts to direct that divine act for the grace to save that soul from hell at that point in time now this is seems strange and maybe presumptuous but we know that padre pio himself stated that he had no difficulty in believing that he could go back and save his uh be with his uncle who was on the verge of death 25 years ago so if padre pio can do it so can we and this is i hope anyway so we see this this wonderful uh redemption on the cross making of the good thief jesus's first triumph of love and hopefully through us joining him in that same mission of of looking with love on those about us with his own eyes letting jesus within us touch them and let them see jesus through us to recognize that he is lord their lord now we move on to the the third word of the cross all right the second in this series which we read that again this love of jesus which is hindered all right 
despised and neglected by creatures, unable to pour itself out, becomes more intense and it gives him unspeakable tortures. Again, when we understand that the frustration of love and the, uh, uh, the inability to let it be received uh, gives Jesus tortures, not just because it's love that needs to be poured out, which is the nature of love. How different from us, who basically are always looking for love to come to us, to take love from others. That here, God, who is love, only wants to give it and have it received. And to have it not received gives him tortures. So in these tortures, we read, this love keeps investigating for what else it can give to man and to conquer him. And this love makes Jesus say, oh, look, soul, how much I have loved you. If you don't have pity for yourself, at least have pity on my love. And so in the meantime, Jesus seeing that he had nothing else to give man because he wanted to give us everything. As I paraphrase, Jesus turns his languid eyes toward his mama and she too, more than dying because of Jesus's pains as we read. And the love that tortures her is so great as to render her crucified like you, Jesus. Her oneness with Jesus allowed her to feel everything that he felt as she had the divine will, as you knew now, those of you who have received this great gift have that ability infusing yourself with Jesus and growing closer and more conformed to him to feel his own pains in you. This is a growing uh, reality for us that as we progress in our prayer, in our virtues, as we grow closer and closer to God, that he shares what he's going through in us, especially during this time of Lent. It's often, as Father Anusi would share, that during Lent, that we might experience times of desolation, times of despair, times of great sadness and sorrow. And how much Jesus during uh, this Lenten season uh, in the liturgical year is a reenactment, if you wish, of his passion time which is ongoing all the time. And so as he might is experiencing the darkness in our world and we feel his suffering yet now, that we also might feel that darkness in ourselves and, and not understand where it came from. It doesn't make sense. There's nothing bad perhaps happening in it. And yet this dark mood can come on us and it can be just like what mama here now uh, watching her son uh, slowly dying and in anguish, an anguish of love, that she felt that same pain, the frustration of love. And the love that tortured her was so great as to render her crucified like Jesus, like you, Jesus, mother and son. And it says, you understand each other and you sigh with satisfaction. And what's the satisfaction they feel initially? The satisfaction refers to that they know what they are about. It brings me back again to that great movie, uh, The Passion of the Christ, when Jesus, on the way to the cross in the Via Della Rosa, stops to his mother and says, Behold, mother, I make all things new. And that's what he's doing on the cross, making all things new. And as she looks at him and he looks at her, they have that shared understanding that this was necessary to make all things new. That this absorbing of the darkness of, of sin and the, and the sharing of love on behalf of everyone was necessary. And so as Jesus was casting about inside himself, as what else could he give? He saw his mama, right? And feeling comforted in seeing that you can give your mama to the creature, right? Jesus considers all of mankind in the person of John. 
And with a voice so sweet as to move all hearts, you say, Woman, behold your son. And to John, behold your mother. What a great moment, a great revelation of the maternity of, of Mary over all of us. She's our mama, our celestial mother. And your voice descends into her maternal heart. And united to the voices of your blood, the life in your blood that calls out to Father, right, for forgiveness for sins, which is what his blood was doing, washing all clean, right, loving all of us, being shed for our sake. It keeps saying, my mother... I entrust all of my children to you. Feel for them all the love that you feel for me. And may all your maternal cares and tendernesses be for my children, our children now, right? You will save them all for me. And Mary, our mama, she accepts. Now, this acceptance of Mary, of the maternity over all of us, that happened, vocalized, proclaimed on the cross, didn't begin there, as we read both in the Virgin Mary and the kingdom of the divine will. And in the book of heaven, in various places, we see that, that this maternity was given to Mary at the very moment of her conception. Now, granted, her conception so occurred in the eternal now, right? And yet in that moment of her creaturely conception in Anne, these, the six, six steps that we read about where she, through the trials and tests that she had to pass, she was both given the fullness of the divine will, declared immaculate from all sin, given the queenship of all the universe, and be proclaimed queen of the divine will. And in that moment, uh, we are told by Jesus that she acquired the motherhood of all of us within herself, that she enclosed your souls and mine within her soul at that moment. And she was given care for all of us, a care that she then enclosed around us as we were being conceived even as babes in our mother's womb as well, that she as mother was there with us. She redid our lives in the echo of Jesus, redoing all of our lives when he walked the earth so that she had given, given the sovereignty, the motherhood of us, caring for us throughout our lives in every step, in every heartbeat, in every blink, every, every moment of our sleep, she was there with you mothering you. Even if your mother should forget your own mother, she never forgot as God never forgot. And that love was always there, you unaware, but she always loving, caring for you. So this maternity, this motherhood of, Jesus, of Mary for us persists now as she all now missioned to help you grow in this gift of the divine will, to let go of your human will, as she did, as she nailed it to the divine will, she wants to take and hold your divine will, your human will for you, so that you can follow her in this living in the gift of the divine will. She wants to share all that she became through the gift of the divine will, all that she could do. She wants to teach you to do as well, because as every mother, she wants her children to have everything she has. She's not jealous for her position, although we could never equal her in the graces she received, the fullness of them, but that she wants to pour out on you, all right, so that you too uh, can, can join her in her court as kings and queens of the divine will. This is your mother's heart. And this is what now from the cross, Jesus bequeaths her to you and I, right? And so call on her, right? She's constantly waiting on you, waiting to help you, all right? And so 
She's there for you. Finally, we come now to this fourth word on this cross for this uh, 21st hour of the Passion. We're suffering, Jesus says, uh, while I remain abandoned, clinging to your heart and counting your pains. I. This is now Louisa uh, commenting on what she sees while she waits with Jesus. I see that a convulsive trembling invades your most holy humanity and your limbs are shaking as if one wanted to detach from the other. And amid the contortions, because of the atrocious spasms, you cry out loudly. And now this is Jesus. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And at this cry, everyone trembles. The darkness becomes thicker. And your mama, petrified, turns pale and faints. My life, my all. My Jesus, what do I see? Ah, you are about to die. Your very pains, so faithful to you, are about to leave you. Now, why would, why would these pains be faithful to Jesus? Because he sees his pains as his tools, right? In a sense, weapons to defeat darkness and hell. These are the very coinage, if you wish, of his merits that he purchases for you and I to redeem us, to save us, and to open the gates of heaven for us. His trouble was not with his suffering from nails or from the cross or from many that he suffered all along this way. His pains are the loss of souls, his longing for souls, his constrained love yet again, even in this word. And so, at the same time, Jesus, now, at, after so much suffering, with immense sorrow, you see that, that not all souls are incorporated in you. So Jesus sees that not everyone will receive his love. There will be those who reject it right up into the moment of death, and they will be lost to him forever. And rather, you see how many will be lost, and you feel the painful separation of them, his children, as they detach themselves from your limbs. And you, having to satisfy divine justice, justice that God the Father protects because he is a God of order, and justice is how things need to be in order for them to be right, and in order, and here the great injustice was that he who is love was not loved. God the Father's love has not been returned to him because of man's sin in Adam, and then all the sins that we, his children, their children, have as a result of that fall have caused to create this injustice. But in order to satisfy that divine justice, Jesus in the conference of the divine trinity agreed to be the one to come down, become human in order to satisfy that through his divinity to make a divine life pay for a divine injustice. The only way it could have happened. And so he agreed to feel the death of each one of them, of us, of all those who are sinners, all of those who are headed for hell. And he has agreed to feel the very pains that they will suffer in hell. Just pause on that and imagine yourself waking up from the dream of life where you think, oh, there is no hell, there is no God. And then to find yourself separated from he who was your source, your love, your creator, your destiny your happiness for all eternity, and here you rejected it and are forever lost. The despair, the torment you receive, and the experience in your bones, the desolation of it. This is what Jesus will feel and take on himself 
each of our sufferings, for each individual in hell, he's taking on for everyone in hell. And so with that, he cries out loudly to all hearts. Do not abandon me. If you want more pains, I am ready, he tells us. But do not separate yourselves from my humanity. Our connection to Jesus's humanity is what will save us. His divinity through his humanity is redeeming us. But we have free will. And that free will can calm us to our eternal damnation. And this, he says, is the sorrow of sorrows. It is the death of deaths. Everything else would be as nothing. If I didn't have to suffer, he says, your separation from me. It's his loss of you that's causing his, his greatest pain. Oh, please, he tells us, have pity on my blood. The blood which calls out to you. Have life through it through his shedding of it, through his wounds, through which the stripes he had borne heal us, through his death, which he poured out without any concern to himself, just out of the, the self-giving, emptying of self that love is, that he did on the cross. Have pity on that and let it not be in vain. Right? Let it not be to the loss of you anyway. Right? And this is his, his call to all souls. And our call in the divine will is to make that our call as well, that we cry out with him. A, a cry that will be continuous in all the hearts. He says, oh, please do not abandon me. And that me is now you and I with Jesus combined into a new we, the Christ we, the Christ I of Jesus, right? This is the love he's calling us to be vulnerable to, to be willing to experience on his behalf. So uh, as we understand how deep this love is, how his, his humanity, which was inseparable from his divinity, as he tells us in the book of heaven, right? The second person, the blessed Trinity, could not be separated from God the Father. But when Jesus became human, that humanity could take on and absorb within itself all that darkness of hell itself. And the, and the abandonment that they did to God he experiences in God's abandonment of him, okay? Because the separation that was created by self-condemnation is experienced by God as well. We abandon him and we feel abandoned and so does God. And here Jesus felt the fullness of that abandonment there in the form of the separation from even his father. Father in his divinity, it would be incapable of touching this, this suffering and the pain of abandonment. But in Jesus' humanity, like us, he feels the fullness of it. And that's what's causing this tremendous darkness in him and the privation that was necessary for this, this gift, this suffering, to be real and to take effect. All right. And so uh, he tells us how that working in, in creation had to be, how important it was for him to, to be the one to suffer that loss, the loss of, of all the souls brought into himself, that he would offer himself to suffer the privation which the very damned suffer in hell. He said, how much did this pain cost me? He said, it cost Jesus the pain of hell and ruthless death. But it was necessary out of love for you. And he said, I would have done more if I could. It's all I had to give. And I gave it all for you. So uh, he had to absorb all the pains and very privation, privation of, his, 
of God's own divinity. So as we now join him and are willing to become so vulnerable as to love as much as he did through this growth and this gift in us, to, to, to have that kind of courage, to be vulnerable to that kind of pain, which we couldn't do on our own, but Jesus can. And as we get out of the way and join him in this privation, this suffering, as Louisa did, he will take pity on you in that and help you as you, as you attempt to help him. But as you experience that, we know that this is important for us too, for us to die, die to everything before we experience the fullness of life in his, in his heaven, right? A death that we complete in purgatory, which he's now calling us to do even now in this Lent. And so we read as well, don't you want to understand that before dying, you must die to everything, to suffering, to desires, to favors, to everything. And we're told in another part, to even to humility, <laughs> so that we become nothing, empty as we were made, uh, the nothingness he made us out of, so that he can fill us with his everything. The self-emptying Jesus did on the cross to emulate to us how to do this, that that everything must die in my will and in my love, he tells us. That which enters eternity in heaven is my will and my love. All other virtues end. Patience, obedience, suffering, desires, all of they end. And only love remains. Only my will and love will never end. Therefore, you must... Die in advance in my will and in love. And of course, through the hours of the passion. And then this gift of the divine will, we learn how. And in that learning how, gain heaven. And he said, this is for all of my saints. He said, I myself didn't want to spare myself being abandoned by the Father. Right? He went ahead of us, even into that abandonment, so as to die completely in the will and the love of the Father. He said, how much more I would have been willing to suffer. Oh, how much more did I yearn to do for souls? But all this died in the will and the love of the Father. And so also, have the souls done who really loved me? I, do you love Jesus? Do you love the Father? Then love this divine will, which gives us the ability to die with him as he does on the cross this Lent, this coming Holy Week. We have the opportunity to not just pick up our cross and follow him, but to join him on the cross, die with him, so that on this coming Easter Sunday, we rise with him in glory, in honor, all right, so that his will be done. And we bring that will down on earth so all might do the will of God as it's done in heaven. So this is our prayer from the divine will era for you and all of you for this coming Holy Week, that you be aware that you're called by every step that Jesus takes to join him in it and to accept all the graces he's offering you. And for all those souls who may right now be tempted to sin and lose themselves into hell, for all those who are on the verge of dying, dying in ignorance or rejection of Jesus, to have a metanoia, and we draw them back from hell because the power of Jesus living in you is the power that can do that. And the divine will can allow that power out of you through your divine act. So just let Jesus do that in you, even as you watch, even as you sleep, that those acts have the power of saving souls. So this is our prayer for you this week. We hope to see you this coming Holy Week as we hope to have a live broadcast uh, Thursday and Friday, Good Friday, will also be there for you with a live reading 
of the entire 24 hours of the passion that tune in and be a part of it as we as we accompany Jesus through every step of his passion. So God bless you. Good night and fiat.